everyone. This is going to be a lesson on the Roaring Twenties. And uh, we're looking at how the Roaring Twenties got their name as far as the economic boom that happens during this time. And there is a massive economic boom during the Twenties. Um, this was largely because of the effects of World War I. First of all, <clears throat> after World War I, the United States is really the only country that has any money left. And part of that comes from the fact that we got into the war so late but also has to do with the fact that we improved technology greatly during the war. Um, a lot of this had to do with building tanks and building guns and all that other stuff. We used assembly line technology that was going to make things better and faster, more efficient and cheaper. This will then bleed into the consumer culture that is going to make consumer items much cheaper as we've already seen in previous lessons. Because of all of this, we are actually going to end up with the world's highest standard of living. The average American wage is going to soar 22% during this age. Work hours and the days of each work week is going to decrease, which leaves people for more time for entertainment. And a lot of Americans are actually getting a vacation for the very first time. Because of this, we are going to see um, a big focus politically on economics. And so we're going to start off with our first president during the 1920s, which is Warren G. Harding. Um, Warren G. Harding was definitely a common man's president. He was tall, he was good looking, he looked like a president. However, although he looked the part, he was not so smart. He was very gullible, he was of average intelligence, but he was chosen because of his quote-unquote folksy attitude. He was a man of the people. He was not the um, elitist like Wilson had been. Um, and what he was really running on in his election or in his campaign was a return to normalcy, bringing things back to the way that they were before World War I interrupted everything. And his version of this was that the United States was the economic powerhouse of the world. Um, he was going to do this with what was known or what became known as the Ohio Gang. These were his friends and political allies that he appointed to high government positions um, that he had gotten to know while he was governor of Ohio. And so these were basically, in, in certain respects, actually just his poker buddies and his, his guys that he would hang out with. Uh, the problem was that a lot of them were unqualified, and the worst part was many of them were corrupt. They used the fact that he was so trusting and that he was so gullible to their own advantage. They sold government positions, they gave criminal pardons, they laundered money. It was a lot of really bad stuff that they were doing, and it did mar his presidency. Um, he truly becomes a new Republican president. Um, the Republican presidents before this had been very focused on trust busting, had been focused on, um, uh, on uh, antitrust legislation, and unfortunately that's not going to continue on uh, from this point on. The new Republican ideals are going to go back to laissez-faire economics that had been supported during the Gilded Age. They are going to disregard antitrust laws, and they are also going to cause the struggle of the labor movement. They are not going to be supportive of labor. Um, <clears throat> there are going to be a series of strikes and riots during this period of time, which will um, uh, come to a head later, uh, later on in the 1930s. Um, and we also get the Ford Nee McCumber Tariff, which is going to be another uh, Republican cornerstone, which is that they are going to raise tariffs. The idea behind this is that it is going to encourage Americans to buy American, helping domestic business. However, it hurts the European countries that needed to export to the United States to be able to pay back their World War I debts. Also with Harding's administration is going to be scandal, and it has to do largely because he was just so gullible. Um, a massive oil reserve was found at Teapot Dome in Wyoming, and this was going to fall under the administration of Secretary of the Interior Albert B. Fall. Now his job is to deal with all of the natural resources in the United States, oil, timber, uh, gold, etc. And um, instead of managing this as he should have, he decided that he was going to make some money off of it. 
He had the land secretly placed under his control and he accepted bribes for oil drilling rights. Um, this eventually went to trial and uh, many of the people involved were uh, convicted of evidence tampering, of jury tampering. It became a huge scandal. However, Harding was largely unaffected by this, partially because he was uninvolved and also because in certain instances he was just straight up unaware. Which, yes, this does make him look really bad. However, it doesn't really matter because Harding dies. And he's replaced by his uh, vice president, Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge is uh, the exact opposite of Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding was, um, was fun and folksy and he was kind of a man of the people. Coolidge was the opposite. First of all, he gets the nickname of Silent Cow because he was a man of very very few words. He was calm, he was very shy, he was very quiet, he was supremely moral and incredibly boring. Um, he ran for his own presidency a year later in the next electoral uh, round in 1924 uh, with the uh, campaign slogan of stay cool with Coolidge. Um, he was re-elected because he was a conservative um, because he was dedicated to isolationism, keeping us out of foreign affairs, as well as being very, very pro-business. This was also the first uh, presidential election where women were allowed to vote in all the states. Um, and you can see his pro-business attitudes in his most famous quote, where he said, the chief business of American people is business. So what are these changes to business under his, uh, under his era? Well, during this time, we are going to get the modern business organizational structure. You're gonna have a division of labor that is designed after factory labor. Um, you're gonna have the sales division, the marketing division, the accounting division. These were supposed to be experts in their field that would run that particular division, kind of like someone who is the expert at putting the front passenger tire on the Ford Model T. Um, he also, or he, they also started to uh, to institute the use of managers. Managers would free executives from dealing to date with day-to-day -day functions like who to hire, who to fire, who's going to be scheduled to work when, and executives could look at the long-range plans, the big idea, the big plan. This leads to a growth of the middle class. The executives are definitely going to be up at the top, but managers, those are going to be the people that are in the middle class, and this is going to uh, create an increase in what is known as white collar work. This is also going to inspire something known as welfare capitalism. This is where companies allow workers to buy stock or participate in some kind of profit sharing or receive kind of pensions or medical benefits. Basically, the business is providing some form of welfare to its um, employees to encourage them to stay with the business. This was really popular with Ford. He paid the people extremely well so that they would continue to work for his motor company. And this then later on became very popular with others. We also are going to see, like I said earlier, struggles with labor. Unionization loses popularity because times are so good. Why are people going to join a union when they don't really need more money? When they're working enough hours? when, you know, things just aren't that bad. Joining a union kind of almost makes you look greedy. So a lot of people weren't joining into unions at this time. The people that aren't going to be doing very well, though, are going to be the farmers. Farmers are going to have a real rough time. See, during World War I, we have a huge agricultural boom. There's a massive demand because we're feeding not only ourselves, but the entire Allied forces. We have an increase in technology at the time that makes it easier to be able to produce the food that we're going to need for this high demand. And although that technology is very expensive, the farmers can buy it on credit, and so they can pay as they go. However, when the war is over, we hit a slump. After this, we have too much food because the technology is so good and because we don't have the demand. We're not having to feed the United States and the rest of the Allies. We're just feeding ourselves. So we have too much food and because the farmers can't sell it, they go into severe debt. So we're going to have a problem here. What do the farmers do? Well, one thing that's introduced is the McNary-Haugen Bill. This 
was suggested saying that Congress would purchase farm surpluses and then sell them overseas. This was actually vetoed two times by Coolidge and farmers were left pretty much high and dry and this is going to become even worse in the 1930s when the Great Depression hits. <clears throat> so in the election of 1928, Coolidge is not going to run for re-election. Instead, we have Herbert Hoover versus Governor Alfred E. Smith. Herbert Hoover you might recognize from the Food Administration during World War I and it was wildly successful. He ran under the campaign slogan of rugged individualism, that America had been made by strong, self-sufficient individuals. On the flip side, Governor Alfred E. Smith of New York was a very well-liked progressive leader. Um, he had been one of those progressive leaders in the urban landscape and had created a lot of those um, uh, city management uh, changes that we saw in our last unit. He also was a leading wet, an anti-prohibition leader. And at this point, people were definitely wanting to get their alcohol back. But the biggest thing against him was the fact that he was Catholic. And pretty much the entire Democratic South was not going to vote for a Catholic. The other thing that put the nail in the coffin for him, Herbert Hoover hailed from Ohio. Governor Alfred E. Smith was from New York. And this was the very first election where the uh, debate and the campaigns were going to be on the radio. Hoover had an Ohio voice, a pretty standard no accent voice. But coming from New York, Alfred E. Smith had one of those grating New York accents and unfortunately that did not go over well with listeners. And so when the election comes around, Hoover wins by a landslide, as you can see. So under Hoover's administration, we are going to be looking at his view of economics, and that is going to be with this gentleman, Andrew Mellon. Andrew Mellon is on our list of wealthiest Americans ever. He was nominated as the Secretary of State, and he believed that government should operate like a business. He was already a billionaire, so hey, probably a pretty good guy to run the country as far as our economics. His goals were to balance the budget, to reduce the government debt, and to cut taxes, especially for the wealthy. This is something known as supply side or trickle down economics. Here's how it works. The theory of supply side economics is that if you lower taxes, especially for the wealthy, they will spend their money on high priced items. That will boost the economy as businesses and then individuals will be able to invest their money and thus bringing in a higher tax revenue. In other words, when the top levels have more money, they spend more money. And that money gets spent at the lower levels, who then have more money to spend more money, which trickles down to the lower levels below that, which then have more money and spend more money. And all of this tax money ends up in the government's hands. The problem is, is that when the taxes of the rich are reduced, most of the time, they don't actually end up spending their money here. They spend it somewhere else. And unfortunately, that's what's going to end up happening. And that's one of the things that is going to be a negative for us leading into the Great Depression. But at this point during the 1920s, we are really looking into isolationism still. We uh, don't want to be involved in other nations' problems. We are still rebuilding from World War I. And we want to avoid further foreign entanglements. However, this also leaves us without allies. And when times do get tough, we don't have really anyone to look to. So we'll be talking about that when we're finished with this unit. I'll see you guys later.